Hello, Wanto community. My name is Anthony Chiffo, and I am the principal here at Wanto Middle School. I uh, hope everybody's having a great summer. We are very excited to be opening our doors again and reopening schools on September 8th. And I put together a little webinar to review our reopening plans as specific to Wanto Middle School. Mr. McNamara and Dr. Ferris have spent quite a bit of time over the past couple of weeks explaining uh, on a more global level what reopening is going to look like district wide. And I just wanted to spend some time focusing on some middle school specific items and reviewing some of the uh, details of the plan. So uh, what I did over the past couple of weeks, I've been getting quite a bit of emails and, and calls from parents. So I took um, like a frequently asked question document and put it together into a little slides presentation, which I'm going to present to you now. And of course, at the end, if you have any other questions, I'm sure you're going to. You can always email me or call me and, and you know, we're here the rest of the way. Dr. Scolari and I have been here most of the summer preparing uh, for a safe reopening. So I'm going to open up our presentation and we'll get started. Okay, so we're opening up, uh, as you are aware, I'm hope, hoping you're aware, we're opening up in what's called the yellow scenario. We've been calling it yellow, which is like a hybrid learning model. At Wanto Middle School, one of the unique pieces of the middle school is that we're actually opening using two different models. We have a sixth grade model, and then we have a seventh and eighth grade model. And the seventh and eighth grade model pretty much holds through to uh, the high school as well. So it's really a seven through 12 model. So I'm gonna start with the seven through 12 model, which is two cohorts, cohort A, B, we've also been calling it cohort one and two. So when we communicate it with you, it, it might actually come out as one, two. So that's the same as, it's the same as AB. So basically the cohort A attends in person on Monday, Tuesday and alternating Wednesdays and cohort B attends in person alternating Wednesdays and Thursday and Friday. So when you're in school, if it's your day to be in school, there'll be about half of the amount of kids that there normally would be in your classroom. So if a class typically has about 28 students in it, um, with the cohort model, your class will have anywhere between 12 and 18 students in it, depending on how the cohorts break down. The tricky part about the cohorts was that every period kids change classes um, and we had to balance out period by period, classroom by classroom to make sure that we were maintaining our six foot distance. So every room is going to have student space that's six feet. As you know, students will be required to wear masks. And uh, each desk will also have a barrier, which I'll show you a little bit later what, they, what those will look like as well. Uh, when students are at home, they will still be getting direct instruction from their teacher. They'll be following the same schedule they would be following when they were in school. They'd be going period by period and every single classroom that they're in will be live streamed. So they'll be able to video into the classroom and they'll be watching the class basically from there. Um, uh, Chromebooks or whatever device they're using at home. Now, when uh, when we send out, oops, sorry, when we send out our cohorts, which should hopefully be no later than Monday, we're hoping to get them out uh, possibly later this week. But if not, Monday will be the latest that you get your cohort assignments. Um, once we send those out, we'll also send out with that a document that lists the alternating Wednesdays and and the, all the days that your child will be in. For example, if it if we're closed on Monday, then cohort A will definitely go Tuesday, Wednesday that week. So we, we balance that out so everybody has equal amount of times in school and equal amount of times out of school. Um, advisory, and this holds through hold true for six through eight. Advisory is not going to be happening this year as it always has. Uh, what we've done is we've taken that 10 minute advisory period and embedded it into our period two class. We thought that uh, it wouldn't be a good idea or it wouldn't be the safest route to have us include that 10 minute advisory where all three grade levels, all three grade levels are mixing up. So we're, we're putting a pause on advisory for this year, but the advisory activities, announcements, attendance, that will all still take place. It'll just take place in the students period two class, um, which is going to start at 820. And I'll review that a little bit later on in the presentation as well. The grade six model is students uh, attending school every single day. Uh, what we did is, and I'll go through this, is we, we went around the building, we came up with eight large spaces that are large enough to house 28 students. That's the approximate class size um, for each section. And we're housing them at six feet distance, same thing, six feet, masks and barriers. We're trying to overdo it with the safety piece. We really wanna err on the side of caution. And, and obviously our priority is to keep everybody as safe as possible. Um, so I'll go through the sixth grade plan a little bit later as well. 
Now, we do have a red plan as well. The red scenario is if we were to get a positive case and uh, if, we were ha if we had to close or if we were ordered to close for any reason, um, we would go to our red scenario, which is going to look a lot different than it looked in the spring. So basically, in the red scenario, students are still going to be following a nine-period day. They'll be getting live instruction from their teachers every single period. So it'll be multiple live sessions per day um, for the 40-minute time. The, we're not going to have the advisory during that period, so the start time will be 8.30, uh, and students will attend periods 2 through 10, and the day ends at 3 o'clock. And if they're in an early bird class, that'll start at 7.50. So we moved to a new learning platform. Last year, we were using Google Classroom. This year, as you learned in previous webinars with Dr. Ferris and Mr. McNamara, we've moved to a program called Schoology. Now, Schoology is... Um, it basically organizes all the digital content into one location. So teachers have easy access and students have easy access to assignments, due dates, assessment dates, um, all in one location. It's, it's a much more user-friendly version of Google Classroom. Um, and it's also very parent-friendly. Parents will be able to view their child's assignments easily. You'll have complete access to it. Um, you'll have a, a separate parent account. Um, so we're still working our way through Schoology. Teachers are gonna be trained on it and we'll be sending more information out from our tech department about Schoology as well. But I think it's gonna be a nice platform for us to use and I think it was a good direction. Uh, it was a good decision on our part to, to go in this direction. I think it's gonna help ease the transition from remote learning to live learning. <clears throat> so this is just a sample classroom. Uh, I just wanted you to see, and Mr. McNamara had this picture included in his webinar as well. So where my arrow is right here, this is a typical classroom setting uh, at the six feet distance. So normally classrooms are spaced uh, much closer. The desks are, are basically touching each other and they're all in rows. Some classrooms had alternate seating models where they were facing each other. The guidance clearly states that desks have to be um, three to six feet apart. Six feet apart would be the optimum um, distance, which is what we're trying to achieve. And uh, they all have to be facing the same direction. So, you know, it feels like we're taking a step back because we've been really spending so much time trying to alter the classroom environment and, and you know, add some flexible seating options in there and change the environment. And now here we are being told that we have to be everybody facing in the same direction. So this is an idea of what the classrooms will look like. Down here is what the barriers are going to look like. I don't have a live picture of those yet because they haven't come in yet. But basically, as you see, they're going to be attached to the desk using these little um, these little uh, clips here. And then it actually goes over past the desk a little bit as well. Um, so these will remain on the desk. Every desk in the school is going to have one. And then also every classroom is equipped with a uh, hand sanitizer. So students will be encouraged to sanitize as they're entering and exiting the classroom. And our custodial staff will be working very hard to sanitize desks at night as well as uh, making sure that they keep the sanitizers um, filled. Okay, so sixth grade. So this was the biggest challenge for us was finding spaces to bring our sixth graders in every day. Unfortunately, we couldn't accomplish it with the seventh and eighth grade because of the intricacies of the seventh and eighth grade schedule. It was just too, there's too many choices in sixth and seventh, and sorry, in seventh and eighth grade. But in sixth grade, we were able to find some large spaces that we can safely get students into and basically keep them in those rooms all day and let the staff move around to them. So for the black team, they're gonna be using, we turned the upstairs and the downstairs cafeteria into classrooms. We've turned room, room 4, 16 and 17. It's two classrooms that are divided by a door. Um, I'll explain to you how that's gonna look, but we're gonna be, basically that's gonna be turned into one classroom. The band room is a classroom. And then on the gold team, we made two classrooms in our IMC, which is our library. We did the same thing that we did in 4, 16, and 17. We did it with room 305 and 306. And then we also, we had a room that had a, a temporary wall that was basically the size of two classrooms that we were using as two classrooms. We knocked the wall down and we made that one classroom. So just to give you an idea what these rooms look like, this top left here is the IMC East room. It's a little bit smaller than the West room, um, but we're, we're gonna be using that room primarily, I think, for the students who are um, who chosen to learn remotely. So there'll be less students in this room live, and then the remote kids will also be remoting into this room uh, live stream. Then this is the other side of the IMC. And as you can see, the desks are spaced out nicely at six feet, and the barriers will be on those desks. 
This is our double classroom that I was talking about that we knocked the wall down and it's the size of two rooms spread out. This is our band room, which we've now converted into a classroom. They're on risers and again, six feet, uh, easily set six feet distance with 28 desks. Then I have a picture here is the upstairs cafeteria. Nicely spread out again. Uh, all these rooms will also have smart boards and, and the technology needed to run a classroom. And this is the split room, 305, 306. So these rooms, each room has 14 desks. So a full class is going to be spread out between two classrooms. But the nice part about these rooms is these are going to be the rooms where we have two teachers. Uh, and we also have um, at least one aide in these rooms. So the team, the teachers will be team teaching within the two rooms, but there'll only be 14 students in each room. That was the only way we can do it and space them out safely. Um, but they'll be working together and students will be getting the same lesson. These will be our ICT rooms. They're not going to be divided by, you know, ICT students and non-ICT students. The students will all be mixed up and just evenly spread out amongst the two rooms. There'll also be times where there'll be reading and math teachers in there. So at times you're going to have up to four or five adults rotating between those two spaces. So that's the layout for the classroom. The only rooms that are not shown here is 416 and 17, but it's a duplicate of 305 and 6. And the downstairs cafeteria, uh, at the time I was taking these pictures, the downstairs cafeteria was getting painted. So I was not able to get a good picture of that space, but it looks very similar to the upstairs cafeteria setup. Okay. So attendance is a question that's come up quite a bit. And um, basically, just so you know, so I explained the sixth grade team is going to have one live streamed room for our virtual learners. We actually might have two live streamed rooms for each team for, for some logistical reasons, which I don't really need to go into, but there will be live streamed options for students who are working from home that will basically be streaming into the classroom, just like our seventh and eighth grade model uh, with when you're home that day, you're live streaming into a classroom. Now, here's the tricky part about the attendance. So if you're absent, if you're, if you're scheduled to be in school, let's say you're cohort A and, and it's an A day, so you're in school live, but you are not well enough to attend or for whatever reason you don't come into school that day, you can still log in and live stream so you don't miss the content of the class. So basically you can participate via live stream that day. However, you're still gonna get marked absent for attendance purposes. It's just, the, the it's, it, it makes the most sense from a management perspective in the classroom for teachers to be able to manage and, and log when students are physically in school versus when they're at home. Uh, we will make a note if a child learns from, decides to stay home that day and learns from home, we'll make a note that they did log in. However, they're still gonna be officially marked absent for that day. If you happen to be working remotely that day and you decide that you're not well enough to, to, to log in and you don't log in that day, you'll also be marked absent um, for that period or, or that day. Um, so that's that's the attendance policy. And then same thing for full time remote learners. If you chose to be a remote learner full time, whether you're in sixth, seventh or eighth grade, the days that you don't log in, you get marked absent. The days that you do log in, you are, are marked um, present. So the really only intricacy is the students who are supposed to be in school who decide to, to work remotely that day. You're welcome to do that, of course, but you'll still be marked absent for the day. All right. So lunch. Obviously, we had to move our lunchroom because I showed you a few slides earlier that the sixth uh, grade classrooms are now being housed in the lunchroom upstairs and downstairs. So that means we lost our ability to offer lunch in the um, traditional lunchrooms. So we've converted our gym, the big part of our gym, into a lunchroom. Uh, we can safely seat about 112 students spaced six feet apart in that lunchroom. Dr. Scalari and I will, will review procedures for the lunchroom with students on the first day of school and the second day of school when the two cohorts are in. But basically for seventh and eighth grade, fifth period is a seventh grade lunch. They're gonna come in fifth period. There'll be um, long tables that are eight foot tables that we can fit two students at because they'll still be six feet apart. And we have desks um, spread out in that room. And I'll show you a slide. Uh, I think I, it's a slide right here. So it basically looks like this. These are the tables here. You can fit a student here and here and there's still six feet in between. I'll have them marked. And then we have these desks for the overflow as well. On a day that it's it's not nice enough to eat outside, we can still fit the entire cohort, graded cohort in that lunchroom. On days that, now this is not including students. If students are learning remotely, it lowers the amount of people, kids in school. So we'll actually have much more space than we, you know, we, we anticipated for everybody in school for that cohort 
uh, in the lunchroom, which we can easily fit. We also have outdoor eating spaces, which we could probably fit between 30 and 40 students in. We're going to rotate students through those spaces as well. So that'll lower the amount of students that are actually in the gym on nicer days. We realized that in the winter time and on rainy days, we're not going to be able to utilize that space. So we had to ensure that we had enough space in the large cafeteria, which is the gym. So students are going to come in. I'm going to ask that they go right to an assigned seat. They probably will let them choose their seats uh, the first week or so. And then once they choose and they settle in, that'll be the seat that they're um, to stay in at all times every day. The lunches will be either you bring your own lunch or a grab and go lunch, which will be delivered to the gym and lined up along somewhere, probably along the bleachers. So student and they'll have the names on them. So if they order the lunch for that day, their name will be on the bag. They come in, they take their lunch, go right to their seat. Now, the tricky part about lunch is I'm really going to have to ask students to limit movement during the lunch period. This is time where they can take their masks off because they're eating lunch, but I can't have them roaming, roaming around. Normally during lunch periods, they walk around, they, they interact with their classmates. They're sitting really close to each other. We can't have that. So we are going to have to ask, and, I'll, and I'll, that'll be my job to talk to the students about, they're really going to have to stay seated as, as best as possible. We will try to get them outside for some recess at socially, you know, at, at good distances and keep them six feet apart. We do want them to get, you know, some activity during that time. I was really happy I was able to implement recess last year. You know, this all kind of threw a monkey wrench into that, but we still are going to try to accomplish that. And masks, as I said, are uh, must be worn at all times, except for when they're in the cafeteria. When they're in the cafeteria, if they get up and walk out to the bathroom or have to go and get their lunch or whatever, they do have to put their masks back on. Um, so that's the seventh and eighth grade lunch. Now, seventh grade eats period five. Period six, the lunchroom's not being used. So that'll be the period that our staff can get in there and disinfect all of the lunch table surfaces. And then period seven, our eighth graders come in. So those, so those tables will be disinfected for our eighth graders when they get in. Um, our sixth graders are eating lunch in their classrooms. By the way, the sixth grade rooms all happen to be air-conditioned spaces. So I'm comfortable with them sitting in those rooms for the entire day. They're real nice, comfortable, large spaces for them. They're going to be eating in those classrooms, and uh, the lunch will be delivered to them. There'll be supervisors monitoring them. We'll try to get them outside when we can as well, and we'll also come up with a rotation for sixth graders to eat in the outdoor seating areas uh, as well. So every single period, the outdoor seating areas will be sanitized after fifth, after sixth, and then after seventh before the next day. And the gym lunch room will be sanitized during sixth period because there'll be no students in the gym during that time. So students who are eating lunch will be sitting down at sanitized um, stations um, and, and sixth graders will be at their own desks. So uh, there'll be no need to re-sanitize them. All desks will be sanitized at night as well by our staff. Okay, so that's our seventh and eighth grade cafeteria. Hallway travel, this is a tricky one. So these pictures are not um, our school. I just kind of pulled these off the internet uh, uh, just to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing with our hallways and with our stairwells. So basically we, we had to limit the use of lockers. Well, not only limit, but we had to abandon the use of lockers for this year because that's the period, that's the time where students seem to congregate the most before school and in between hall passing where they go to their lockers, they're all crowding around lockers. So students won't be using lockers. Um, they're not going to be permitted to gather in the hallways any time. So we altered our, our entry time, which I'll go over later, so that we don't have students congregating. When they come in the building, they go right to their second period class. And in between periods, again, no lockers, so they go right to their next class. To their next class. Uh, and sixth graders stay put anyway. Now, hallways are going to be clearly marked. We'll have some lines right down the middle. Similar to this, I think we're going to have a double line, though, and a, and a whole maybe two foot space where it's like a no entry area. And then we'll have a, a walking side on the right and then a walking side on the opposite right, you know, depending on which direction you're walking. With arrows, I actually just got uh, about probably a thousand markings delivered to my office today. So we're going to spend the next week or so uh, putting these markings all over the building. Uh, and then the stairwells, they're not going to be one directional hallways or stairwells. So that's why we're dividing the hallway in half and we're also dividing the stairwells in half with arrows to show students, you know, which direction uh, they should be, which side of the uh, stairwell or which side of the hallway they should be walking on. Okay, bathrooms. This is a tricky one. And, and just keep in mind that this plan could all, this is, this is a fluid plan, you know, and we can change things. Once school opens and we spend the first week observing how it's going, 
we could alter this plan in, in many different ways. For now, we're trying to limit the use of the bathrooms during hall passing because that's the time where we get groups of five, six, seven, eight, sometimes 10 kids using the bathroom at the same time. We're, we're probably going to only allow maximum of two students in the bathroom at a time. The bathrooms are pretty large and, and multiple stalls, but I think we're gonna allow two students per bathroom at a time, which will be monitored by hall monitors and, and other staff. And the tricky part is in between hall passing, it's gonna be very difficult to monitor that. So we're gonna start off not allowing bathroom usage in between periods. Now that is gonna cut a little bit into instructional time and we realize that, but when, we, when we're weighing out that versus safety of students, uh, we rather err on the side of caution. So students can use the bathroom during class time. They'll be monitored by, by staff. If there's two people in there, we're gonna have distance markers outside in the hallway where they can line up and wait to use the bathroom. But in between periods for now, we're gonna start off with, uh, with closing the bathrooms during those periods. Okay, so this is a big question that comes up quite a bit. And, and what are we doing with specials? So all of our specials are running, except for one, which I'll go, I'll go through at the end. Um, but PE is running. Um, we're gonna try to go, we're gonna take advantage of the nice weather early on. Um, you know, even on little cooler days, you know, we're gonna ask students to, to, you know, wear sweatshirts, jackets. We're gonna be outdoors as much as we possibly can. We do have access to our back gym and, and our back gym is fairly large. I don't know if you've ever been back there, but you know, we can fit 20 to 30 students back there, or even 40 students back there spaced out at 12 foot distance because for physical activity there has to be a 12 foot distance not a six foot distance so we do have the ability to do that in the back gym and and you know but we are going to try to go outdoors whenever we can with the cohort model our classes are much smaller and and 28 students for sixth grade can safely fit in there so pe is either going to happen in classrooms outdoors in the back gym uh, they're not going to be using the locker room so the locker rooms are going to be off limits there'll be no changing for pe this year so just keep that in mind as students are, are you know, preparing their wardrobe for, for that day. Um, but our PE staff has been working really hard to come up with alternate activities. It's going to look a lot different, but we are still going to be able to have physical education. There might be times where it's more lecture based than activity based, but, you know, they're going to do the best that they can. And they've been working really hard to come up with a curriculum that I think is, uh, is going to be pretty special. OK, so music. Again, this is another tricky one because band there's there's some strict requirements for band and vocal music uh if you're if you're playing an instrument or if you're singing we do have to maintain a 12 foot distance we just don't have the ability to do that with the size of our band and chorus in any space around the building uh, especially since we're giving up large spaces for our sixth graders so mu much of our music classes are going to be theory based but we're also going to have instrumental lessons that still happen so if your child's in band they're still going to go to band they're not going to be playing during that period. It'll be like a band theory type of class. And then they'll still have their rotating lessons. We have a classroom set up where they'll be going to that classroom for their lessons. And we can safely space small group lessons apart at 12 feet. Uh, and same thing for chorus. Sixth graders, their music is going to be a, a general music type of class. And if you chose band, chorus, or orchestra, again, you'll be getting them through small group lessons. So you still will be learning the instrument but just in small lessons, the large uh, ensembles won't be happening this year. World language is another really tricky one. Seventh and eighth grade, no change in world language. We're still able to offer that because of the cohort model. For sixth grade, we were unable to group our classes by the language that they chose. There were too many other factors that went up, went into our grouping, academic factors, and, and just so many other things that went into setting our, our, class, uh, our classes we felt that we would be undoing all of that if we then grouped them by the, the language that they chose. We, we explored many different options for this, including having students learn with headphones on, kind of remotely, all doing different languages in the same room. But we felt that would be a little distracting and, and not really conducive of a good learning environment. So what we ended up landing on for now is we're going to do a, it's called a FLESS model, which is basically the model that we use in elementary school. Students are going to get a taste of Spanish, a taste of Italian, and a taste of French throughout the year, about 10 to 12 weeks of, of each language. Um, so our staff is all trained in doing that, able to do that, certified to do that, and, uh, and they'll be delivering those languages to the students. And they're going to tweak the curriculum so that when they move into seventh grade, they'll have enough of that sixth grade curriculum to then move into their language choice by the time they get to seventh grade. 
Um, so that was a tricky one, that, and that was how we, we got around it. The sixth grade wheel and creative mind classes is all still happening. It's just going to happen in classrooms. They're not going to be rotating from class to class. The teachers are, are literally going to come to them. So we had to redo our whole sixth grade master schedule to accomplish this, but we did have the staffing to be able to accomplish it. Seventh and eighth grade electives, again, all still happening. Um, and as long as we're on the yellow, any model, whatever model we end up with, they all will still happen um, part live, part remote. Horizons. We are not running our Horizons program. Usually the Horizons program is for sixth grade only, and it's one period every other day. That is not going to be running. There was no way for us to make that happen here with staffing and space reasons. So there is going to be a Horizons program. It's going to be virtual. More information, as Mr. McNamara and Dr. Ferris said, more information for that will be coming out in the coming days. So they'll be they'll be reaching out to families to discuss that and what their plan is for that. But they are doing it. It's just not going to look like uh, how it's looked like in the past. Okay, supportive and special education services. Reading and math, we're still maintaining the push-in model um, for all grades for these services. And, you know, we're going to ensure that every student gets what he or she needs, whether they're in person or at home. And if you're at home and you're in, in require reading services, our reading support teachers who push into the classroom can work with your child remotely through the Chromebook, uh, but we are gonna make sure that everybody gets what they need. Same with Wilson. This is offered as a pull-out service though, not a push-in. So we have rooms set up for students who get pulled out from sixth, seventh, and eighth grade for Wilson services. And if you're a remote learner, if you chose to stay home and learn remotely full-time, you will still get that service uh, from one of our staff members. And same with special education services. This question comes up quite a bit. And I can assure you that all IEP needs will be met both in the classroom and at home. Our staff is being trained, our staff is working um, with our PPS director, um, and, and they will make sure that, uh, we'll make sure that they're able to interact with students in person or remotely to meet every child's needs. So class size, this question comes up quite a bit. Came up in the seminar last week with Mr. McNamara as well. So the approximate class size for sixth graders is 28 students. Some might have 26 or 27. Um, but but no classroom has more than 28 students. Again, they're double-sized classroom and they stay in, in their classrooms all day. Seventh and eighth grade, the approximate size is roughly between 12 and 18 students. Now, again, I, I couldn't do straight 15 and 15 for every day because the, the schedule is so complex and, and every period students move to different classrooms. So I can balance it out for one period, but then the next period it all mixes up again and if I try to balance that period, it messes up what I balanced for the period before. So I was able to get it down to between 12 and 18. I don't think any classroom has more than 18 students in them because we weren't able to space out at six feet um, any, any more than 18 students. Students do travel from class to class in seventh and eighth grade. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people have asked about bringing in wipes versus you know sanitizing in between classes. We don't have the ability to sanitize desks in between classes. We have probably over a thousand different desks in the building and and only four minutes in between periods it's just it's just physically impossible to do so i do know that mr mcnamara is looking at options for that so we'll be communicating that out um, in in the coming days um, but that's the plan right now and again all classrooms students are faced are spaced at six feet distances and we also have desk barriers at every single desk all right so the am arrival plan this has changed significantly as well typically we would have the buses pull up to the front of the building by the flagpole parents drop off um, in, in under the colonnade. So we're gonna have to do temperature checks every single day as students come in the building. And, and we're gonna ask for your help on this as well. So we're gonna ask that you take your child's temperature before they leave, before they walk out the door each morning. If the temperature is above 99.9, .9, please don't send them to school. However, we're also gonna do our own temperature check as students get in. So you're gonna have a, a, a form to fill out weekly um, but we're also asking for your help to just screen your child before they come in each day. When they do arrive, buses are going to pull up under the colonnade and they're going to let off there and they're going to go into the main into the main entrance. Walkers or or dropper offers are going to come. Excuse me, they're going to come around the back of the building. For those of you who took part of the um, the locker pickups or the eighth grade moving up last year or, or a couple of months ago. It's a, when you pull in, you make a right into, into the central administration office parking lot. You're going to go around the back of the building and you're going to come out and you're going to you're going to go through the colonnade. We're going to be letting students out of cars under the colonnade 
When they get out, they're going to be on the high school side. They're going to go in through the cafeteria doors, up the stairs, and they'll actually enter the middle school from the second floor. Every single child, as they get out of their car or get off the bus, will be temperature screened. Um, we're not allowing students in the building until 810. So if buses pull up earlier than that, they're not going to be allowed in until 810. And, and if cars pull up earlier than that, again, we're not going to let students out of cars until exactly 810. And, and the reason for that is so we don't have students congregating in the hallways. And so we have enough staff to, to, to properly supervise students as they're making their way to their uh, second period class. Second period class starts at 820. So as they get off the bus, they'll have their, their temperature checked. We have about 10 health aides that are going to be outside on both sides of the colonnade doing those temperature checks. If their temperature is 100 or higher, they're going to be escorted right to the nurse's office. We have a, like a quarantine nurse's office. It's, it's, a, it's a whole nother room that's not the actual nurse's office. It's next door to the nurse's office, the same size, actually probably a little bigger. That's going to be for six students. So if they temperature is over 100, they will then go get escorted to the nurse. And then the nurse will do her own screening and determine if the child has to be sent home. Um, or if it was a false read or, or whatever. So that all occurs starting at 810. Just be patient. You know, it's going to take some time for us to get it, get it, you know, down pat. It's going to, it's going to take a little longer to get students in the building. We're hoping once we get it down and system down pat by 830, the latest, all students will be in their second period class. 820 is when second period starts, but from 820 to 830 is technically the advisory period. So announcements, attendance is being taken then. Instruction doesn't start until 8.30. All right, so I, I think I kind of just reviewed the way it's going to work. So buses are going to come in from Wantor Avenue. They're going to come to the main entrance, and they're going to let off there. Students will get screened, uh, and I went through that whole process already. Uh, by the way, I'm going to share with you this presentation without me speaking as well, so you can rummage through the presentation on your own, and, and you, know, you can also view it with, with my comments um, as you're viewing it now. So the a the uh, drop off plan again around the back of the building. I just want to show you. I'm going to skip ahead for a second. So this is the drop off route. So if you look, let me get my my mouse. So this here is Wantor Avenue. Okay, and this is like I guess this is probably I forget which building this is. I don't know if it's King Cullen or one of those one of those stores in that shopping center. But this is Wantor Avenue. This is Beltor. So typically you come in, you go this way, and you drop your child off under the colonnade here. The new route you're going to take is to come in and you're going to go around the back of the building, pull in through the colonnade on the high school side. This is the high school, this is the middle school, and this is the colonnade. So you're going to drop them off under the colonnade on the high school side. They will then go into the cafeteria, which is about here, up the stairs, and then they'll cross the colonnade from the second floor to get into the to get to their middle school classrooms. And then after you drop, you're literally going to drive right back out, back to Beltor and oops, and back to Wantor Avenue. Buses are going to pull in the same direction as you, but they're going to turn into here and then they're going to drive past the flagpole and they're going to go right into the colonnade this way on the other side. And when they go out, they're going to go out towards Daffodil, I believe, is the street, which is right here. So Daffodil is going to become an exit only block. So cars are not going to be allowed to come in on Daffodil. Buses will be going out on Daffodil. So we're just trying to limit that traffic. So please, when you drive and drop your student off, please try to enter this way and then do follow the route around the back of the building that way. Okay. Um, just want to go over quickly. Let me just see if I missed anything here. No, I think I covered all that. And again, you'll have this that you can read through at your leisure. Just want to go over some protocol. Um, this slide, again, you can look over. So this slide is for if you're screening your child for COVID before, and we ask that you help us out and do this before they come in. If you don't have any flags, they can come to school. If, if you know that they've been exposed to somebody or with that means within six feet of somebody who, who is a confirmed positive COVID case, um, or if they're showing, um, if they have a diagnosis of, of COVID-19, or if they're showing at least one of these symptoms, then, then we're asking that you do not send your child in and then you notify us and, and you know, we'll give you further information from there. If the child does come to school, once they arrive, we'll have our own screening. So this is our temperature check screening. If they check temperature checks okay and there's no flags, they go to class. Once they're in class, let's say they 
present some symptoms once they're in class and the teacher notices some possible symptoms, they will send them directly to the nurse to be evaluated. If they come in off the bus or out of a car and they are positive, or they all have a height, they do have a temperature, excuse me. So let's say they have a hundred or higher, they will be escorted directly to the nurse who will then evaluate the child again. And, and if it's confirmed that they are showing symptoms or have a fever, then the student will be sent home, okay? So that's basically how the flow chart's gonna work. And I'll leave this, you know, you can, you can look through this again more closely when you have the presentation. Okay, so Mr. McNamara and Dr. Ferris reviewed this. Um, after school activities are um, not gonna be happening at least for the start of, this, of the year. So we're gonna try to do virtual on just about everything that we can. Curriculum nights, parent-teacher conferences, presentations, award ceremonies. We're gonna do virtual on everything. We had a taste of that last year. We did some award ceremonies virtually. Parent-teacher conferences and, sorry, curriculum night will be the first real big virtual event and we'll send out information about that once when the time comes. Um, we're really trying to limit the amount of people and, and parents who visit the building. Um, we will have procedures for anybody who does have to come into the building. You'll have a, a form that you have to fill out. You will get your temperature checked as you're coming into the building. Um, but we really ask that we limit the amount of people that enter the building. Um, and we're going to try to do most of our transactions in the vestibule um, so the parents don't have to come into the building. And also with sports, that comes up a lot as of now. Um, middle school and high school athletics are, are slated to start September 21st. We don't know if that's going to happen or not, and it's really not our decision. That's a that's a, um, a county or state level decision that we'll, of course, adhere to whatever guidance they give us. Um, the bell schedule doesn't change much, except I just wanted you to see the period two change. Usually, this was 816 to 826 was first period, which was our advisory, and then 830 started period two. In the new schedule, we, we did away with the advisory. We still have our early bird classes, so students can still come in and they can take a high school bus to come in for that. And it's from 737 to 817. Then period two starts at 820, goes from 820 to 910. It's still the same instructional time. Instructional time used to be 830 to 910. Now it's 820 to 910 because we've embedded the advisory in there. And then periods three through 10, three through 10 are still the same as it always has been. And this will hold true for if we move to a red model as well. The only difference is if we move to a red model, students really won't have to log in until 8.30 um, for period two. And I'll probably figure something out for announcements um, like we did when we were on uh, remote last year. I mentioned this already, but lockers are, um, are being shut down for this year just to avoid the congregating in the hallways. So this is, presents some challenges and, and we're gonna work with our staff to try to limit, and I'm gonna ask you, your help as well, try to limit the amount of things that your students are carrying. They can carry backpacks or string backpacks. Um, it's gonna be a challenge though to, you know, I'm gonna ask you to travel as light as possible and, and try to combine binders. We, we did look at our supply list. I'm gonna be sending that out with this presentation as well uh, in an email. Um, the supply list actually, I thought it was going to shrink, but it actually grew. So I apologize for that. It grew a little bit because of these shared materials that we are no longer able to use. So, so we, we're asking students to have some of their own materials um, with them. It's not a tremendous amount more, but it is a little bit more than, than what was on the original list. Don't panic about supplies, though. You don't need to have them for the first day of school. You can, you can get them at your leisure. Um, you can even wait until school starts and let the teachers explain what they need, and then they come home. But we do want you to try to combine binders when you can. Um, we're asking teachers to try to limit the time, amount of times textbooks have to go back and forth. So we're going to ask teachers to either keep textbooks in classroom or send them home and keep them home and limit the back and forth. Chromebooks will come back and forth each day. Um, you know, and so that's one thing that we'll be traveling with them. But I, I work with your child as best you can to try to, to limit the amount of things. We don't want them lugging around these giant backpacks all day. Um, we'd like to, to you know, limit the amount of paper that our teachers are using. We're going to try to use Chromebooks and electronic whenever we can. We're not eliminating paper, um, but we're going to try to limit it as much as we can and stick with the Chromebooks as much as possible. And Schoology will help with that as well. We talked about bathroom usage again. We're not going to be using hall passes and bathroom passes. Um, we actually discontinued that last year before COVID was even a thing. I, I just felt like it was just passing germs from student to student. So we're still going to continue not using that. Hall monitors will be in the hallways. They'll be able to monitor the bathroom traffic. Um, we're, we're limiting bathroom, we're, we're not having bathroom usage during hall passings, and there'll be distance markers and reminders for hand washing um, spread out all over the building as well. 
Uh, sixth graders are going to have their orientation. It's not going to be the traditional picnic that we've always had, which is unfortunate. We had such a great year last year. We had a great time playing games outside and playing music. We just can't do that this year. So we are going to break it up into five different sessions. These are the times. By now, if you're a sixth grader, you should have already received this your time. If you did not, please email me and I'll make sure that you get a time. If you're a new student who didn't get one, please email me as well and we'll get you a time. Students are going to tour the building with their guidance counselors. So each group has approximately 40 or 50 students and we'll going to break them up into groups of 15 to 20 with each guidance counselor. Those groups were arranged strictly by alphabet and, and counselor. They are no indication of the class your child will be in. I got that question so many times sent to me after I sent those lists out. There is no indication about classes um, with how we set up the groups for orientation. So just keep that in mind. Um, they'll be getting their class assignments the week of September 1st. Uh, that's true when we should be getting that. And same for seventh and eighth graders. You'll be getting the week of September 1st, you'll be getting your schedules as well. Uh, so while students are touring for the sixth grade orientation, Parents are going to be invited to meet me and Dr. Scolari outside. We will have, um, right on the lawn behind me, we're going to have chairs set up, spaced six feet apart. We'll have a sound system out there, and we'll do a little Q&A for, for, for parents as well, and we'll kind of go through the um, procedures for the school year as well. Um, but we'll, that'll be your time to ask questions live. And Chromebooks, that's another question that comes up quite a bit. Our tech department is arranging a Chromebook pickup prior to the picnic, I believe. I think it's going to happen the week of August 24th. So you'll be getting notification from our tech department soon about that, which is next week. And you'll be able to come in, pick up your textbook, uh, I'm sorry, your Chromebook outside, and, um, and they'll, they'll take care of all that for you. If you are new to the district, they will also arrange a Chromebook pickup. If you didn't hear anything by the end of next week, you can contact me and we'll, we'll arrange it for you. So another challenge is extra help in Homework Central, as well as all of our clubs. So, so all of our clubs are going to be virtual where we can. Some clubs might not run. I'm going to talk to the staff. Any staff member that has the ability to do their club virtually will. Um, Homework Central is, a, is usually every day that students can go to the library and there's staff there that can help them with their homework. We're hoping to develop a virtual model for Homework Central. We haven't worked out, ironed out the details fully for that yet. Um, so once we do, we'll communicate that. And uh, extra help will be offered. There'll be a combination of remote and in-person. I think a majority of it will end up being remote. And again, details for each specific teacher's extra help schedule um, are still being worked out and, and it'll be communicated by your child's teacher and potentially by me as well. So transportation, hopefully by now you've decided if you're gonna be sending your child on a bus or not, if they qualify to be on a bus. Um, early bird busers will still receive the early bird if, if that's the, um, what you choose to do. Uh, Mr. McNamara had sent out a form, so hopefully you received that and, and you have filled that out and indicated, yes, I will be a busser or, or no, I won't be a busser. And if you didn't qualify for a bus, it doesn't matter. You know, obviously you don't have to fill it out. So on the bus, students are going to be required to sit one person per seat. The buses will be disinfected each night before each day. Uh, siblings are encouraged to sit together. That's a way for us to get a few more students on the bus. Masks are going to be mandatory at all times. One question we get a lot is, do we have monitors on the bus? Unfortunately, we do not. So, so you know, we're really going to go by our bus driver and, and really rely on you to, to remind your students, your children, that they must keep their masks on. And, and it's really a matter of safety and, and not only keeping themselves safe, but keeping everybody safe. And not only students, but, you know, you don't want to bring home something to your house which then you know, could affect a family member. So really help us embed that in everybody's, you know, um, into our students' minds that, that the importance of wearing the mask, not just for you, but you know, showing some empathy for others as well. And that's really why we decided to go that route. I kind of went through this already, visitor protocol. Everybody's gonna get um, temperature checked. If they do have to come in, we're gonna try to limit all visitors to the vestibule. And, and we're really trying to limit the amount of people that come through the building. Um, but if you, do, if you do have to be in the building for some reason, you'll get your temperature checked and you'll have to fill out a screening form as well prior to uh, entry. And again, also have your ID as well. Uh, one other question that comes up quite a bit, I just thought of, I don't think I included this in the presentation, is security. You know, we spent so much time tightening up security and then now we're letting kids go outside a little bit more frequently for lunch. For, for mask breaks we're going to be doing and, and for PE, we are, we are going to have security um, 
increased security around the building as well as outside. We'll have a security guard outside at the eating areas when students are eating outside as well. So our staff is getting trained. Um, you know, they're going to be learning, you know, just basic hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette. We're going to be, they're going to get trained on um, recognizing COVID symptoms. And, and basically we're going to be embedding into the students and to parents the importance of staying home when appropriate. Um, and, and, you know, just kind of going over protocol. That'll all happen the first few days before students come in, when, when teachers come in for our professional development days, they'll be learning all those protocols. Okay, so our staff, our custodial staff has been working super hard getting the building ready. And once the school year starts, they're gonna be working even harder on the cleaning and dis disinfecting protocols. Um, you know, frequently touched surfaces, door handles, sink handles, um, they'll, be, they'll be disinfected as much as possible. And 100% and every night, the whole building will be disinfected. Um, Mr. McNamara explained that a little bit in his presentation as well. We're trying to limit the use of shared objects. We're not opening drinking fountains except for the bottle fillers, which we do have around the building. Um, they're going to be cleaning at a more rigorous level, and uh, they'll have a disinfecting schedule, and, and I'll be on top of that as well, making sure that they're adhering to that. And uh, again, staff will be retrained and trained, and uh, the buses are going to be disinfected at the end of the day and, and high, services, high service areas between runs, the full bus at the end of the day. I talked about our staff training protocol. They'll be going through training um, September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And then um, we're, we're here. Uh, you know, the, one, one thing that's really important to me is the social emotional well-being of our students and staff. And, and we're going to be surveying our students. We're going to be surveying our staff. We're going to do our best to meet their needs. Um, we have two school psychologists, uh, Dr. Taylor, who has been with us previously, and uh, Dr. Zelenitz, who was the Forest Lake uh, school psychologist, has um, moved over to, to us. Uh, we're very happy, very lucky to have her as well. Um, so, so they'll be working with students and staff and uh, just, just keeping a close eye on, on the social emotional well-being. I know, I mean, I have two children of my own. I know my daughter's a little nervous about going to school. She's nervous about wearing the masks. Um, so we, we recognize that uh, it's going to be a heavy lift for us in terms of monitoring the social emotional um, needs of all of our students. But, but that's going to be a priority for us and we will certainly do that. And we'll, we'll communicate with you and we ask that you communicate with us as well. Okay, so our school nurse is our designated COVID-19 point of contact. If you have any questions, concerns, you know, protocol questions, please reach out to her. Um, she's going to be in there. To, we actually have, we have her. We've added some nursing staff into the room. We have a health monitor, a health aide that's going to be in the room as well. And again, I told you we have a, a whole separate nurse room for sick children. Um, it's a very big, large, comfortable room as well. Um, so we, we've added that space into our uh, building as well. All right, so communication is key. I'll be communicating with you as much as I can. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. You can, you can access our school website at wantoschools.org. We do have, a, it's a brand new website, so you might need some time to navigate through it to figure out where everything is. But all the information that was on the previous website is on this one. This one's a little more user-friendly. Hopefully you're receiving emails. If you didn't receive this email and you somehow stumbled upon it, because we're also gonna post this on our website, but if you stumbled upon this and didn't receive the email, please contact me at chifo, C-I-U-F-F-O-A at wantoschools.org. Um, or you can email the parent portal. Uh, I believe it's parent portal at wantoschools.org. That's our tech department's little help desk. So they can help resolve that as well. Uh, I haven't been posting on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram over the summer. But for those of you who, who know me, I'm very active on social media. Once the school year gets rolling and, and probably soon as we get closer, I'll be posting quite often. Anything that needs to be communicated, I'll also communicate through social media. You can always contact myself or Dr. Scolari through the emails that are listed. You can call the main office. Uh, I'm in, oops, I'm in the rest of the way. Dr. Scolari's in the rest of the way. We're in daily. So you can call the main office. You can call the guidance office at this number, um, or you can call the school nurse at the number, which you can't see right now, but it's on the uh, slide uh, if you do the slide. There it is, 679-6359. Okay, so that is the overview of the changes that we made and, and what school is going to look like from our perspective and from a safety perspective. What hasn't changed, however, is our brand. And, and what is our brand? The Warriors Care brand. And, and we have a huge emphasis on the importance of building positive relationships with students 
and positive relationships with staff. That hasn't changed. That will never change. You know, one of our guiding concepts is that children need to feel cared for before they're available to learn. When I first started teaching, one of the first when I started teaching, I was a phys ed teacher. I was asked to teach, uh, to coach volleyball. I didn't know a thing about volleyball. And uh, my athletic director, who, Fran Nacella, who's a, a mentor of mine, pulled me aside and I was nervous about it because I, I didn't want to appear that I didn't know what I was, was doing or what I was teaching. And she, she made a comment to me and said, students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And, and that one line has stuck with me for my entire this is my 20th year in Wantoff through my entire 20 year career. Um, the importance of students understanding that you care for them. It's one thing to care for a child. It's one, it's another thing for a student to know that you care for them. So that's always our goal. That's always what we're striving for. Our staff is on board with that relationships matter and, and that's our brand. So, so that has never changed and will never change no matter what learning model we're using. And I hope you gathered that. For those of you who have been a part of the school last year, I really hope you gathered that during our time at home after, after March 13th last school year. Um, we, we care deeply for our students and we're gonna continue to care deeply and we wanna make school a fun learning environment. It's gonna look different this year, but your child, I can assure you, will feel cared for whether they're learning remotely or if they're in the building. That's all I got. Thank you, everybody. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, I'm sure you will. If you have any questions, we're here. Our door is always open. We want to make this transition from you know not being in school to being back to school as smooth as possible. We've been working day and night to make sure that we have a smooth opening for you. We're trying to cover every possible scenario. Will there be things that were missed? Probably. You know, there there's always going to be what ifs uh, and yeah buts. You know, but we're going to do everything that we can to address those what ifs and yeah buts as they come up. And, and we want you to be safe. We want your child to be safe. And uh, we want your child to have a positive learning experience. So thank you for joining us. This is going to be posted on our website. I'm emailing it out to you. Um, you're going to be getting your supply list, um, updated supply list in the same email as well. And uh, I wish everybody a restful uh, next two weeks. And we look forward to seeing you sixth graders on September 3rd and seventh and eighth graders on uh, and sixth graders on September 8th. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you.